This story starts with a young boy called Kirono Hisamitsu leaving his home for his high school medical exams. But as soon as he opens the door he is transported to another world. Three years pass for Kirono in this new world and he has changed his name to Kirono Kiroford and has the tag of the Kefos Empire Battalion Commander. As a commander, he leads an army of 1,000 men against an army of 10,000 soldiers. We see the huge battle going on and suddenly one enemy soldier sneaks behind Kirono. He slashes Kirono's right eye with the sword and catches him off guard. We see Kirono grabbing his face trying to stop the bleeding and he leaves an energy blast called Tensu Kagura. This attack lands on the enemy and blows off the face. The soldier was confused by the attack and wondered what it was. We see Kirono panting on the floor and we are explained that his attack isn't some cheat ability. It's a power made by knowledge and obligatory education. Kirono looks at the battle between his army and the enemy, we see that demi-humans are a part of his army too. Igni's formal halt who is the general of the Holy Algo Kingdom comes near Kirono. He has lost his right arm and is still a part of the battle. Kirono is impressed and suddenly we see someone yell ambush. And that's when Igni's asks everyone to retreat and protect his highness. Kirono falls to his knees and asks his soldier if the plan was successful. The demi-human tells Kirono that their detached elven force has returned. Kirono is shocked by this and looks at Layla's worn out condition. Layla is a demi-human who is a half-elf. She is injured from the battle and apologizes to the commander. After the death of the 100th men commander, she decided to become the commander and lead the army. She feels she lacks power because out of 300 men, only 47 returned alive. Kirono is shocked by this news and we time skip to several days later when Layla says that she wants to quit the army. Kirono asks her the reason for quitting and she has no answers. But she thanks him for visiting her several times after the battle. Layla feels happy that her commander said he is honored to have a subordinate like her. Layla was born in a slum and is the offspring of a prostitute mother and her customer. She has faced sexual violence several times before she joined the army. She calls herself a filthy half-elf and says there is no way she could make Kirono Sama proud. She talks about how the demi-humans are treated harshly in this world. Kirono is moved by this and he declares the Global Human Rights Declaration. Layla asks what it means and Kirono explains to her how all humans that are born deserve equal rights. Layla has never heard of something like this and Kirono wants her to stay in the army. She asks for some time to rethink her decision and it's granted by her commander. It's night time and we see Layla grabbing Kirono. He feels that she misunderstood his intention and tries to stop her. Layla confesses her feelings to her commander as she makes a face that would turn on Kirono. Kirono stares at her and says to her that look isn't fair, we are sure something happened between them after this steamy interaction with confessions. We see Tilia, the Kefaus Empire Imperial Princess. She grants the title of the new feudal lord of the Alakis to Kirono. He never imagined obtaining this title so early and feels he is just an amateur who manages lands. Kirono wants to know the reason and Tilia says that she has high hopes for him. Being the new feudal lord Kirono gets back to giving back to the people. He starts by selling the old feudal lord's collections to raise money. He puts up an auction to sell them and the money will help the people of his land. He assigns news human resources like Sheila as cook landlady, Alyssa as head maid, and Alina as the accountant. Kirono then goes on to scout former mercenaries for his army. He uses his knowledge from his world to make paper and sugar. He helps the poor people with food and shelter and also starts night battles with beautiful girls. We see Layla stripping her clothes saying that her love is only for her commander. She shyly says Kirono Samad starts here. We see Kirono thinking about how he never thought about being transported to another world and leading an army of soldiers into a war. He never imagined being a part of the domestic affairs between humans and demi-humans. Also, the best part of his day and night battles with beautiful women who beg for his affection. Alyssa arrives with a letter from the imperial capital for Kirono. He praises Alyssa while taking the letter and reads it in front of her. It says because of the loss of 350 men from the fight with the Holy Algo Empire, they will send some reserves to him. Kirono looks pleased by reading this letter, we see his new look with the slash over his right eye. Since he was appointed the feudal lord, he has been focused on human resources and this solved the labor shortage. He looks outside the window and wonders what kind of new people would join, he is hoping for some new encounters. Two weeks later we see Kirono being chokehold by someone on the ground, he desperately tries to tap the ground. His army men look at him struggling to get out, now we get to see the story of why he was being strangled by this mysterious girl in the first place. We are at the imperial capital of Filk in a horse stable, a demi-human is sitting as some girl works picking up the horse stuff. He asks her if she is serious about this and she says yes, because it's her job. She is the 12th imperial guards member, Fae Mulafane. Silva is a dwarf who is the horseshoer. He reminds her that her juniors are learning how to ride horses while she cleans the place. She asks Silva about his plans and he says being a dwarf he has his limitations and fewer choices compared to her. 
He tells her being a human being she was able to join the Imperial Guards because of her sword skills and she also comes from a Count Rank noble family. Silva also praises her beauty which shocks Faye and she checks out her ace in a bucket of still water. Silva tells her that she doesn't have to clean horse dung and many merchants would want to marry a girl of her status. Faye feels even though her status might be big but her house has no worth right now. The Mulafane household has no territory and after her father's death, the house is on the brink of getting ruined. She says that she wants to build a good reputation in the military to restore her family's name. Silva asks her how she is planning to do that. She raises the shovel in the air and yells with hard work. Silva asks her to be careful. She feels if you work hard then your dreams come true. Previously she was always punched for her blunders but now she is punched less compared to before. She asks Silva if he has a dream and he tells her how he dreams of being an architect and making structures that will go down in history. Silva feels he has worked enough as a horseshoer for the nobles and that's why he is learning architecture in his way. He feels that no one would hire him, Faye taps his shoulders and tells him it's fine as long as he works hard and that his dreams will come true. Silva asks her if her ultimate dream is to restore her family's glory, and she says that's not all. Faye wants to fight alongside the country's strongest knight Loneheart, and Silva is impressed by her dream. He asks her about how she is not allowed to ride a horse or wear the Imperial Knight's armor, she asks him to not worry about these matters. Faye tells him that she can use God's technique, he is intrigued looking at her pulling her sword out. She says oh god bless my sword and pulls out her sword. Faye's sword is shining with black energy around it, she says god's technique blessed holy blade. Silva calls it a curse technique and wonders how she calls it a god's blessing. She is confused by this and Silva explains how the black muddy energy makes it the image of a black knight. She defends her powers by saying that it's the result of her prayers to the goddess that controls jet black chaos and she gives her the powers. Silva doesn't seem too pleased with her explanation and Faye calls him a meaty. A soldier arrives and says that Faye San is being called by the leader. She is flabbergasted by this news and Silva happily asks her to leave so she can live her dreams. Faye runs like lightning from the stable in excitement and arrives at the 12th Imperial Guard's leader's place, Batil Pisuk. He asks her how long has it been since she joined the 12th Imperial Guards. She says it's been more than four years, and Batil blocks his nose saying no wonder she smells like horse dung. He asks her if she has heard about the Alaki's territory matter, and she starts explaining in detail what happened. Batil understands she knows it all and says they lost 350 men. Batil received a letter from the princess where she asked them to send reserves from the 12th Imperial Guards. He says in other words it's her, Faye is shocked by this and Batil says they didn't say that they need a knight and that's why she should her sincerity in this matter. He says that he will prepare an alternative for her, she knows that he is talking about her body. She thinks about her father who died 10 years ago and her mother who died 4 years after she graduated from the military school. Her dream is to restore her family's name and she would do anything for it. She asks if there are any knights in the Alaki's territory and he replies that yes but their level is lower than Imperial Guards. She thinks about the current Lord of Alakis and how he became the feudal lord because of his accomplishments. She believes that he sacrificed 300 elves, poisoned the previous feudal lords, and invited demi-human girls to his room every night for pleasure. She thinks Kirono is like a villain. She says if he lacks manpower then she will show him her abilities. Faye feels there's a chance he will need her. She imagines herself in a situation where she will be invited to his bedroom. She will use this to restore her family's name in an instant. She screams that she will obey the military orders and this catches Batil off guard, he calls her a damn horse girl. Batil asks her to prepare her luggage as there is a wagon headed to Alakis the next day. Faye says she understands and will restore her family's glory. Fast forward we see Faye on the floor shivering. Looks like she almost missed her wagon but managed to reach Alakis. We see that she had missed her wagon and was dragged into the Alakis. We see a half-elf called Snow approaching her with some bread, she asks if she is okay and would like to eat some bread. Faye is overwhelmed and thanks her for introducing herself. Snow introduces herself and asks if she would like to eat near the bonfire, and Faye agrees to it. Someone grabs Snow's hand asking her what she is doing with a human. He looks at her and says being a woman she should accompany them. Snow says that the moment he knew she was a woman he changed, she calls him no different than the men in the sluts. Snow calls him shameless and this makes him angry, he calls her a bitch and tries to punch her in full force. Suddenly we see that Faye has intercepted that punch with her face, and both Snow and the guy are shocked. Faye looks angry with a fist on her face and she asks him to stop it with anger in her eyes. This scares away the guys and they leave. Snow asks Faye if she's okay and she asks her to have a piece of her bread. 
We see that Snow's bread has fallen into a puddle which makes it inedible and that's why Faye offers her half. Snow is moved by this act of kindness from a fellow human and thanks her. The bread tastes a little bloody because of the punch on Faye's face. We see them sitting in front of a bonfire eating bread, and then they both are sitting in a wagon having a conversation. Faye asks Snow about her mother and the lackeys. Snow looks excited as she will meet her mom. Snow explains that she calls her mom because she helped her in the slums. Faye asks her if she knows her real name. We find out that the lady is Layla. Snow says that she has beautiful eyes and is very beautiful in person. That's one of the reasons she was harassed in the slums. She sighs and wonders if her mom is okay. Snow talks about the rumor about the Lord of the Lackeys being a horrible person and Faye agrees on hearing such rumors. Snow wonders if he will call for her too and if her mom is safe from him. Faye asks her to be calm and says if he calls for her, she will take her place. Snow says she can't do that because her first time should be with the person she is in love with. Faye agrees to it in embarrassment. Suddenly a guy screams at them to stop it. Both of them are scared. We find out that the guy who screamed was actually from Kirono's cavalry unit. They arrived on horses and stopped the wagon asking questions. The wagon rider explains that they have arrived from the royal capital to deliver the reservists. Faye and Snow feel relief knowing that they aren't enemies. The cavalry squad leader's name is Kane and he says that he will be their guide to keep them safe. They arrive at the Alakis' territory and Faye is dumbfounded by the beauty of it. She wonders what kind of guy the Marquis of Alakis must be. We see a room full of steam and Faye completely nude wondering why it turned out like this. She parted ways with the demi-humans and then asked Kane for a place to rest. She is led to her room and it shocks her how big it is. Faye is told that her bath is ready and she can step in. She wonders if she deserves all this luxury for just being a reserve. Faye loves the smell of the scented soap she is bathing in. She comes out in a towel and peeps in the bucket that they have her garments prepared for her. She feels like it must be unfair to Snow that only she can experience this luxury. As she hooks her bra, she says that she will work hard to pay back for this wonderful experience. The next day Kane finds her cleaning horse dung, and he asks her what she is doing. Faye says that she is skilled in cleaning so wanted to be of some help. The two minions behind Kane scream and say that cleaning stables is their job and ask her to not steal their jobs. Faye apologizes for this in Kane's size. He says that he talked to Kirono about her and they decided Faye will join the cavalry. She is happy and overwhelmed by this and asks Kane if he is being real. He shows her a horse and says it's hers from now on. Faye is overjoyed knowing she owns a horse now. She starts patting the horse and Kane asks her to hurry up as there is other stuff he needs to show her. Kane takes her to the armor guy to show her new armor. It's shining and strong. Faye is living her dream and is too happy with her new armor. Kane tells her the joint training after this and asks her to take off the armor even though she is so excited about it. We see a lot of beast men standing outside the walls and they are all shocked by something. We see a silhouette of a girl in armor standing over a defeated beast man. It's Faye in her new armor and her wooden sword. She has beaten her opponent in a training exercise. The beast men are impressed by the newbie's skills and even Kane praises her abilities. Mito talks about how surprising it was to see a newbie defeat an experienced soldier. Faye feels her sword skills are still good even though she hasn't sparred with anyone since military school. With her skills she will be able to restore her family's name. We see the defeated opponent being carried away behind her. Faye asks for her next opponent and that's when Leo steps in. Leo is a leader of 100 lion beast men and the other soldiers wonder if the girl is strong enough to face Leo. Meanwhile, Faye is blushing after looking at Leo, she tries to calm herself down and focus on the fight. They both look ready for the battle and in an instant Leo approaches Faye at lightning speed. Faye can read his moves because of his wooden sword, but Leo changes his move between his attacks. Faye is shocked by this skill move and still manages to block this strong blow. She flies backward with the force and Leo again attacks her in an instant. He gives her no time to breathe, Faye wonders how he can attack at such a distance. Faye ducks down and dodges the sword but we see how Leo extends the sword length by sliding off the handle midst attack. That was a warrior move. Faye finds an opening and kicks Leo in the gut and sends him flying backward. Leo praises her kick and Faye feels that she is almost defeated. The battle between them continues and Faye wonders why a guy like him is in the lackeys. She deciphers his power and feels it isn't pure strength or technique. Leo's true strength is his experience and overwhelming judgment. We see that Faye is taking over Leo and he is on his back foot. Faye feels Leo is very strong in battle. They clash their wooden swords in full force. We see that Leo stands shocked with his broken sword. Leo looks at Faye and finds her overwhelming presence changes the atmosphere. Her sword starts emitting dark energy. The beast men wonder if it's the god's technique. The energy starts fading off and Faye says that she lost the battle. Leo asks her the reason for it. Faye feels she enhanced her powers with the god's technique but did it without thinking. She feels it isn't fair at a sparring match. Faye tells Leo that next time she will beat him with her sparring skills, and Leo says that it's going to be him who will be the winner. 
He leaves the scene and Faye wonders if she should have shaken hands with him. We see Kirono standing amongst his men and Faye looks at him thinking he is a human soldier. She asks Kirono for a match not knowing who he is. Kirono grabs a wooden sword and asks her to go easy on him, she agrees to it. The battle starts and Faye thinks Kirono is full of openings but his eyes look like he has been through wars. They go at each other with their swords. She feels it will be dangerous if the fight is dragged out. She throws away her sword and tries to choke Kirono. We see Kirono foaming from his mouth on the floor. Kane laughs at the scenario and says that it's funny to strangle your superior not long after her recruitment. The beast men feels it's not funny and Faye understands that it was her mistake. We see Layla rush towards Kirono. She puts him on her lap and asks Faye how dare she do this to Kirono-sama. She is furious with the new recruitment. Faye is in shambles as she feels she lost everything down the drain on her second day. Snow arrives asking her mom if Kirono is okay. Kirono wakes up after hearing someone call Layla a mom. The chapter ends with this crazy scenario. Layla says that she has never given birth before and tries to explain the situation to Kirono. Kane finds the quarrel interesting and we see Faye still stunned by what she did. Kirono asks Snow to call him Papa from now on. Snow is shocked by this. He says she can't be left in the slum and he will take care of her. He wishes them to stay as a family. His soldiers are impressed by his decisiveness and others think it's because he passed out some time ago. Snow says sorry and explains to Kirono that she has always called Layla as a mom. But she isn't related to her in any way. Kirono seems relieved with this revelation. He heads back to his mansion and Layla asks him if he's okay. Faye feels she missed her chance to apologize to Kirono-sama. Kane feels he will forgive her because he is a kind guy. But he isn't too sure about it either. The next day we see Alina done with her work. She seems like she pulled an all-nighter with her tax work. Kirono praises her work and Alina didn't expect the work to be this much. He says she did a good job and asks her to read out the reports. The Alaki's territory made over 60,500 gold coins and she feels the bandit's income should be decreased. The slave merchants that have the most income cover the loss, he feels they are working seriously. Alina asks him who is he talking about, he is talking about Kane and the other guys. He doesn't mention the bandits because he feels she hates them, as they and slave merchants were the ones who sold Alina as a slave. 35,000 papers were sold to the Pix company and one paper was worth a brass coin. Their profit is 10 gold coins and 10 silver coins. Kirono was worried because he hired 10 more people but he thinks it will be fine. He added 10 more people because of Goldie, the blacksmith dwarf. He checked the copy of the production line and felt the materials supply couldn't handle it. He asked for 10 more people in the paper workshop. Kirono thinks about it and Alita says that he doesn't look too happy with the reports. He feels they can't add the material cost because the trees are naturally grown in their territory. They can't call it a success and he plans to build a second workshop to cultivate trees. Alina calls him a worry wart. He explains if they keep using the trees then there won't be anything left in the territory. To get a stable supply the need to create a cultivation program. Kirono asks if there is anything left and Alina asks why is he making new barracks for demi-humans even though they aren't getting any subsidies. She feels Kirono is favoring the demi-humans. He denies this and says he is just building a new public place. During the winters the farmers have no work and he just wants to give them work. It's a way of giving back to people who paid taxes. Alina says she is done with her reports and Kirono asks her to rest after her good job. A blushing Alina asks him if that's the only thing he wants to say. He says yeah that's it. Before she could say something, someone knocks on the door, he asks the person to come in. It's the head maid who informs Kirono that the head villagers and Shin are waiting for him in the waiting room. Alina is annoyed because she couldn't complete her sentence. Kirono whispers something in her ears which leaves Alina's face red. He had asked her to be prepared when she comes to her room, she calls him a pervert. As Kirono is walking in the hallway, looks like the maid wants to say something to him. She tells him that what she is going to say might sound impertinent coming from her but she wants to say it. Kirono is confused by her statement, she says that the people in this land are grateful to him. This hits Kirono, he says but he hasn't done anything special yet. She says he is wrong because as the head maid she met different kinds of people in the territory, and they look happier than before. Now people can enjoy time with their family and live happily. Kirono says he is glad if he made any difference, she also thanks him for saving her and her daughter. Kirono asks her to not mention it as he was looking for an excellent maid, she tells him that because of his kindness, her daughter was able to attend school. She thanks her master Kirono and says she will return the favor with her loyalty. Kirono is happy yet awkward and asks her to not push herself too much. She agrees and opens the door to the meeting room. We see everyone sitting at the table as Kirono enters the room. He asks Shin if today's meeting is about clover cultivation, and she agrees to it. 
Shin is the priest and poorhouse director, she feels they should make the soil fertile for the clovers and has already explained it to the villagers. The heads of the villages look unimpressed by Shin's statements, but they won't talk about it with Kirono as they feel it would anger him. He says that, if possible, they want to use that area's idle field for cultivation. They think about it and someone says that he doesn't plan on using that field right away. They will use 10% of the field and if the harvest is lower than the past 5 years then the land will be exempted from tax. Kirono says he would be happy if someone agreed to be a candidate. An old man raises his hand and says his village will do it. Kirono remembers the old man, his village was attacked by the bandits. Kirono says that they will buy the clover seeds, he shouldn't forget to pick them up and he will be looking forward to the cultivation. Kirono asks Shin for the next topic, she says they will talk about planting now. Until now the villagers were growing only certain plants because it's a farming village, they are biased towards certain crops. That's why Kirono made Shin mention the planting plan. Shin says she wants to end the meeting but she is cut out by Kirono. He asks Alyssa to arrange the carriage, the heads are guided towards the inner garden where the carriage waits. Shin takes a heavy breath as they leave, she was nervous but Kirono felt she did a wonderful job. He feels it's impossible to cultivate beetroot and has already told them they can be used as materials for sugar because it costs more labor. Kirono wants to hurry up and manufacture sugar. Shin can harvest 300 kilograms of beet from his fields, but that will make it into 50 kilograms of sugar and that's too little to start trading. Kirono asks Shin to add beetroot cultivation as a job for the poorhouse. Shin's father started cultivating beetroots and others only saw it as food for livestock. She believed it was for everyone and continued cultivating them. She wonders if it's okay to mix her private and work life this way. Kirono says it's not a problem but she can only sell the harvest to him. Shin understands that he is helping her and thanks him. She feels her father's work is rewarded with Kirono's kindness. She thinks about her father and we see Kirono smile. It's late night time and we see Alina walk towards Kirono's room wearing a nightie. She says I have come and hear weird noises from Kirono's room. She peeps from the open door on what's happening inside. The voice that came from Kirono's room was from Faye, she asked Kirono to take her virginity. Alina wonders what the hell is going on and Faye introduces herself. Alina says it's her turn today with Kirono and Faye says she came to his room for an apology for strangling him. She wants to become Kirono's mistress so she can revive her family's glory. Alina doesn't understand what she is rambling about. Kirono laughs at this and says that all the girls around him are strong-willed. Alina doesn't like his reaction either. Faye says it's been four years since she joined the knights and now finally, she has a horse and armor. That's why she wants to say sorry to Kirono. He says it was just a sparring match and she doesn't need to apologize. She asks if it's true and he says yes. Faye is scared that they will ask for her horse and armor back tomorrow morning. Alina asks her if she wants it in a written note that it's okay. We see Faye running away with a note reading it happily. Kirono starts undressing himself, he smells the strong scent of Alina. She tells him that it's the smell of the soap he asked for the dwarfs to make. Kirono is impressed they made this soap because the ashes are piling up. He asks her if she came to his room prepared for him. He grabs her and asks her how many times it's been done. Alita asks why should she count things like this, he asks again and she screams four times. Kirono tries to kiss her and she denies it as it's not allowed between them. Kirono asks her if she has prepared what he asked for, she is embarrassed by his words. He reaches out his hand and taps her butt with his finger and asks her if it's prepared for him. He starts playing around with her body and says it can't be helped if he takes it. Alina says that she came prepared for it, Kirono says she didn't tell him right away and now that he knows she is prepared he doesn't feel excited. Alina is confused by this and Kirono asks her to beg for it. Alina is red with blush and she wonders if she can beg. Kirono asks her to beg him to get in the mood to ram her. Her hormones start acting up and she understands what he needs, she says please as she bends over spreading her cheeks. Kirono is exposed to her glory and she begs him to put it inside in her backside. He goes in and then starts going harder, the moans echoed inside his room. Alina is struggling with the pain and she knew it would hurt her. Her choker clanks as she is rammed into the bed, she is feeling a different pleasure and her legs are shivering. Alina felt it would be scary and hurtful but seems like she is enjoying the back workout, we see her making faces as she enjoys it with her tits out. Suddenly Kirono starts getting rougher with the strokes and we see Alina struggling with pain and pleasure. He thinks about what Alina said to him yesterday and feels he is running away from the guilt. Kirono feels all humans who are born free have the same dignity and rights, he wonders about the answer. We see Alina gets up and she says that her butt hurts from all the workouts. Kirono says she was the one who asked for it, Alina says he is the worst to do it so rough. Kirono smiles and finds her cute, she is embarrassed by this and asks him to shut up. We see Tilia's mother call her up and she asks Tilia why don't they hold a ball to find her a fiancé. Tilia feels differently about marriage, but her mother says that she has to marry and give birth someday. She asks Tilia if she is interested in someone already, and we see Kirono cross Princess Tilia's mind. 
Chirono receives an invitation letter from Princess Tilia. It says they are holding a ball in the Imperial capital. He says it's been a while since he saw his father, so he has decided to join it. The headmaid says she understands and will start with the preparations. Chirono feels he would have never imagined receiving a letter of invitation from Tilia. He goes back one year into the past where it all started. We see Kirono at the Imperial Capital Military Practice Grounds. Kirono's classmate Simon hypes up everyone before the drill. If they win, they can become Imperial Knights. They are tired of being looked down on by the higher nobles and he feels they need to stand up as low-ranking nobles. We see the interaction between two guys where one asks the other to move away so he can drink water, and the guy asks to let him win the match because everyone has at least one once. Kirono talks about Simon and how he is strong but his main strength is his tactics which he uses to unite them all. We see the drill is about the low-ranking nobles having to capture the flag before the time limit, but the high-ranking nobles will be defending it. We can see that higher ranks have an advantage and the lower at a disadvantage. Simon says that in a real battle, the ranks don't matter, and losing without doing anything would be a shame. He feels if they work together, they can graduate with a smile on their face. Everyone is hyped after Simon's speech and they are ready to take on the high nobles. Simon notices that Kirono is acting on his own and walks in another direction. He asks him what his plans are and stands in front of him. Kirono tells him that he is searching for a place where they can take shelter. Simon is angry with this and asks him why he wants to run away. He asks him to stop as it will interfere with everyone else. Kirono tells him that being at a disadvantage they have to prepare for the worst. Simon says that a noble would never think that way and shames him. Kirono says if battles could have been won by ideals alone then people wouldn't work so hard. Simon gets angry at Kirono and we see Tilia arrive on her horse. They both are shocked to see the princess, they were classmates in military school but never interacted. She asks Simon if he is the commander and he affirms yes. Kirono keeps staring at Tilia as she converses with Simon. She introduces herself as the commander of the defending side and asks them to not hold back just because she is the princess. Tilia asks for a fair fight, and Kirono keeps looking at her as if he is trying to decipher her behavior. Simon says that he will fight with force and honesty, and Tilia leaves saying she can't wait for him. Simon says that he is deeply moved because the princess personally talked to him, but Kirono feels that's a part of her plan. Simon acts cocky and says that she acknowledged him, but Kirono again says that it's her plan. Simon keeps rambling about the fact she talked with him. Kirono asks to change the strategy because they are at a position advantage. Simon asks him to shut up and says they will continue with the plan. We see the low nobles looking at the peak as Simon says we will fight them head on and win. Kirono leaves a sigh. We see Hugo asking Kirono if he is an idiot. Hugo is one of Kirono's classmates. He saw them quarreling before and tells Kirono it's no use to argue with Simon. Hugo says that even he is pissed at Simon because he didn't listen to Kirono's warning. Kirono feels that even if they win the drill their value won't change, but he wants to give it all to win. Simon says that Hugo doesn't look too eager for the battle with his sloppy strategy. His hands shiver as he touches his glasses, he prays that his glasses will be intact after the battle. The Empire doesn't know how to make glasses and he has to buy them from the Free City's very expensive government. Hugo doesn't care about the results as long as his glasses are fine. As they are talking, Simon asks everyone to charge ahead and they march towards the flag. Hugo and Kirono have a bad feeling before the drill, Kirono feels that the enemy should have attacked them by now. As he is talking about their advantage, we see them using bows and arrows to attack the low-rank nobles. Simon orders everyone to put up their shields, the surprise attack is too much for the low-rank nobles. Hugo is scared and says no one talked about archers being a part of the battle, Kirono says they were never expected to win in the first place and it was the master plan of Tilia. The arrows are taking out many people from the attack, Simon asks them to hold on as the arrows will stop soon. Suddenly we see a high rank noble charge Simon with a horse and weapon. Simon flies over Hugo and Kirono, the battlefield is a chaotic mess. Simon lands on the inured men and looks like they have almost lost the battle. Kirono says he never expected them to be this brutal and merciless. He calls the princess a sadist as she orders to trample everyone. Kirono asks the remaining soldiers to run and hide in the grass, everyone starts escaping throwing away their shields. Simon is annoyed with this move and orders them to not run. But the men ask him to shut up and say they don't trust him with his strategies. He watches them run away as he lies there injured. Kirono uses a stick and uses it to roll down Hugo like a tire down the hill. Retreat he screams as everyone escapes, we see him sitting on the grass as he pants for a breather. He realizes how the princess fooled them with a fair and honest fight strategy. She attacked with arrows and also chased them down with cavalry. Despite being classmates, she was so heartless, Kirono feels complaining now won't change anything. He feels they stood no chance from the start, he wants to sit down and waste the time till practice is over. He hears a sniffling sound and looks behind, he finds Simon who is crying. 
Shirono asks him if he is injured and he says he isn't crying because of the pain. He is sad because he was fooled by the princess and let his emotions take charge of his head. He feels he should have listened to Kirono's warning and now he has lost the trust of his friends. He finds it painful and wishes to die, he wants to disappear from the earth. Kirono looks at him crying and asks him to stop. He looks determined and tells Simon they can still make a comeback. They need to gather their friends, everyone is gathered around Kirono as he stands in the middle. Hugo stares at Simon with his broken glasses, he doesn't look too happy about it. Kirono asks everyone to believe in his strategy and everyone is quick to say it won't work and it's of no use right now. He understands that they are trying to protect their pride, and he asks them if this situation doesn't make them feel frustrated. They all look at him with shock and he asks them again, he tells them how they made them run around like animals. If they lose this way, they will become a laughing stock, and ask them if they are okay with that. Everyone starts thinking about it, Hugo asks Kirono to stop as he feels the battle is over. Kirono asks if he wants to give up so easily, he asks if isn't he frustrated because they broke his expensive glasses. Hugo sheepishly says it is frustrating. He asks him to be louder and says he can't hear his weak voice. He asks him to go mad with his anger and that's when Hugo screams in anger that he will slaughter them all for his glasses. Everyone else is surprised watching Hugo go ham, Kirono asks them if they are fine with being losers. They ask him to not mock them and they all get riled up and ready for the rematch. They march out from the grass to fetch the flag, Kirono leads the men as they approach the enemy. As they run the arrows start coming at them again. Kirono asks them to keep going ahead and not wither away because of the arrows. He orders them to break through with all their might, until he orders them to crush every single one of them. Kirono asks his men to show them their low rank noble pride. The clash between both ranks is fierce. The higher ranks are shocked by their guts. Kirono changes the plan and asks his men to crumble two guys on horses. Hugo finds the one who broke his glasses and charges at him. The higher rank guy stamps in Hugo's face and asks him to stay away. Looks like the lower ranks are taking over the higher nobles. But then we see the lower ranks kneeling in front of the princess. Looks like they have lost the battle, she asks him if he is Kirono and he says yes. Tilia is impressed by his tactics but tells him that the game is over and even they used all of their power. Kirono starts laughing and all the other lower ranks join him. The higher rank nobles are shocked by this and Tilia grabs Kirono's collar and asks him what's so funny. He says that it's true they used all their power to crush them. Tilia understands this statement and looks back at the flag. She finds Simon and other men hoisting the flag on the peak, the lower rank nobles lost the fight but won the battle. Tilia is annoyed by this and Kirono tells her that it's a simple diversion strategy. He made her think that they were attacking with all their men but he used another group to take the flag. She is frustrated with him and chokes his collar, he teases her and says serves you right. The lower rank nobles celebrate their win over the high rank nobles. One week later in the school Kirono and Tilia come across each other, she asks him to call her by her name. Kirono says it doesn't seem right for a princess to walk around with him. She tells him they are classmates and there's no problem about that. Kilia has been following Kirono since the practice, and even when he tries to avoid her, she manages to find him. He is confused about what he should do ahead. We see Tilia telling him that running away from her is useless. Kirono feels like he messed up when he said it felt like a date when he was patrolling the territory with Layla. Goldie tells Kirono that he will work on the carriage because he was invited to the ball, he will improve the one which was used by the previous lords. Kirono says he counts on him. He looks at Layla who looks sad as she asks him about his trip to the imperial capital. Kirono apologizes that he didn't tell her about this and explains that it was an invitation from Princess Tilia. She asks him how long will he be away for and he says 20 days. She seems sad with the answer and Kirono asks her if she wants to join him on at the bowl. She says no and feels awkward about it. Kirono knows he messed up because Layla doesn't like it when he mixes personal and public affairs. He feels even if he asks her to join there's no way she would say yes. His brain hurts thinking about what he should do next, suddenly someone knocks on the door. It's Alyssa the head maid, she has arrived with a dress for Layla which can be worn at the ball. Layla is mesmerized by this and Kirono asks her to join him at the ball as his bodyguard. He says this is something only he can ask her to do, Layla feels a bodyguard wouldn't wear that dress and also, they won't let a demi-human join them. Kirono says if they won't allow her, then he will leave with her too. If they start complaining to them, he will shut them off. Layla is happy with this and says she will accompany him to the ball. Before he could thank Alyssa she left, he knows she understands the situation and has come to his rescue. We see Layla and Kirono having a moment and he hugs her tight. She lets out a moan as he pushes her onto the bed. Kirono asks Layla if he can strip her down, she agrees to it and lies there on his bed. We see Kirono munching on Layla's naked body as he finds it hot. Layla moans and tells Kirono how she wanted him badly thinking about him leaving her behind. She yearns for him more and Kirono gives her what she wants. Kirono wondered if Layla hated her and understood his hands were cold. 
Layla is feeling the joy of his hands around her body and he is exploring it inch to inch. Kirono starts feasting on Layla's perky melons as she leaves out strong bones in pleasure. His mouth moves harder as he grabs the other melon with his strong grip. Layla has tears of pleasure and Kirono removes her panties saying that she has more heat down there. Layla is in the mood and asks Kirono for it, she wants it inside her. Kirono gets a perfect grip on the bed and starts pounding his demi-human girl. They moan each other's name in perfect rhythm and keep doing it. Kirono grabs Layla's hands and goes in harder with his thrusts. The whole room is filled with Layla's moans. Kirono tells Layla he is about to let it go, and Layla asks him for his juices. He goes in full throttle and gives it to her. They both are sweaty and tired and lock their lips after this steamy session. The next morning Layla opens up the curtains and apologizes to Kirono for waking him up. He asks her to not worry about it, and Layla prepares to leave for her practice in the early morning. Kirono feels that Layla now looks like a splendid soldier and as if the last night's steamy session was a mere dream. Layla's ears go down because she is shy, Kirono notices it and she asks him to stop staring at her. She leaves from his room and Kirono prepares for his departure to Princess Tilia's ball. Kirono wonders what kind of event awaits him in the Imperial City. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching our manga recap. Like, subscribe, and comment your favorite moment below. See you next time and happy reading.